you got a Bible, you could open up. We're in a series called Embers. We're going through the book of Acts, and today we're back in Acts chapter 8, and this will be our last uh, Sunday in Acts for just a little while. Uh, in May, we're going to take some time and do a series called Changed, meaning uh, we're going to examine passages in, in the Gospels where Jesus encountered people and their lives were changed. We've done that now. This will be the fourth year in a row. Uh, May is our birthday month. So what we like to do at Center Point is we like to celebrate God's grace and faithfulness to us. So in May, we're going to take some time and just celebrate together uh, 14 years of us gathering, making much of Jesus uh, through all of, all of the highs, through all of the lows. He has been faithful. So in May, that's going to happen. But today, we're in Acts chapter 8. And last week, I said uh, there's part of this that I wanted to preach on from a different angle, a different perspective. It's it's sort of like that Thanksgiving dinner with your family where it's so good and after you finish, you're like, I want seconds. Have you been there? Seconds, sometimes people go thirds. I grew up, I remember when my family, extended family, got along. Uh, we used to do, uh, that's the day we live in. Uh, we used to do like some Thanksgiving dinners with other relatives and uh, my family was famous for eating a lot and then, uh, I don't believe it helped, but they'd undo the top button of their pants. I don't know if you've ever been there where you thought, like, I need to fit this in. So when I was going through Acts 8, 26 to 40 last week, I had this other part, but it was too big to fit into our time. I already preach long, so I was like, if I preach this, it's a whole nother sermon. So I, I just uh, had heavy on my heart that I had to preach this because the reality is I think people, uh, for the most part, sometimes in church culture, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we don't really understand. Sometimes we don't know his voice, we don't know his leading, and I wanna take some time and I wanna engage this again because I really want us to get it. I've mentioned the one thing I think that's really missing in the church is walking your life in the power of the Spirit, which then leads to the second issue in the church, immaturity. If we learn to walk empowered by the Spirit and obeying and walking with God, the immaturity leaves because we start to grow mature in the Spirit. And sometimes in church culture, we have a whole whack of Christians talking what they should do or what we should be about when our lives show we don't even live it, we don't even practice it. So we quote the Bible, but it doesn't show up. So I want to make sure that we really engage this so that you could walk away and go, all right, I get it. I understand it. This is where my life should be. So let's read this together. Uh, I do have my old school Bible, uh, but I'm going to read from my phone because I'm old now and I have a hard time seeing my, my lettering. So Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip, he ran to him. He heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and, and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shear is silent, he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this about, himself or about someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself 
at Azotus, and he passed through. He preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Heavenly Father, I just pray as we engage these verses in your word that your spirit would open up our minds, our heart, that we would ultimately be pushed closer to Christ's likeness, that if we need Jesus today, today would be the day he becomes our Savior, that if we need a wake-up call, that today would be that wake-up call, and if we just need encouragement, that we would find encouragement in this passage today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start by telling you about some unlikely things that have happened. Uh, one of the sports that I go, that takes some time to be really good at is golf, all right? So people just love that sport. In fact, there'll be people who aren't in churches today because of this sport. But golf, gol golfers uh, struggle to combine this immense amount of skill and luck needed to achieve something. It's called a hole in one. It's one of the rarest things. But in 2015, an amateur gol golfer he managed to shoot three holes in one in one round while playing in a tournament at the Laurel Hill Golf Club in Virginia. His name was Pat Patrick Wills, and he hit a hole in one on hole seven, 10, and 14, and he went 14 under par, and uh, he claimed uh, overall victory. Now, if you go golfing with me, I'm shooting about 35 to 45 over. That's where I'm at. So when I read this, I'm like, this is incredible. So the chance of a golfer, of Patrick's ability, getting a hole in one has been calculated at 5,000 to one, putting his odds of getting three in a single round at over, uh, at over one in one trillion. Unlikely to happen, but it happened. There's also this lady, her name is Ann Hodges. She lived back in the the uh, basically 30s, 40s, and 50s, but she was asleep on her couch when a meteorite ripped through the sky above eastern Alabama. This is November 1954, and without warning, it crashed through the roof of her house, bounced off a console radio, and hit her on the hip. All right, this is how she woke up. And Anne remains the only person in history to have experienced a confirmed meteorite strike and all she suffered was, was minor injuries, a large bruise to her hip, and she was hospitalized only as a precaution. So she's the only one to have been hit by a meteorite. Unlikely, but it happened. Then in the National Park, we have a ranger whose name was Roy Sullivan, and he holds the Guinness World Record for being struck by lightning more times than any other person. So between 1942 and 1977, Roy was hit by lightning on seven separate occasions, survived them all, gaining the nickname the Human Lightning Rod. And according to statistics, the odds of being hit by lightning once in your lifetime are 10,000 to one, making the odds of being hit seven times, this is, this is mind-blowing, uh, it's 10 octillion. It's one with 28 zeros. Unlikely to happen, but it happened. And what I read in Acts chapter 8 today stands out in this story as an individual, this Ethiopian eunuch, as a very unlikely candidate for conversion, for someone to really be changed, to come to Jesus, to be found, uh, through this supernatural leading of God himself, and not through human planning, not through strategizing, like we couldn't put this together. The person, as I mentioned, he's from Ethiopia, he's in Africa, and he had come all the way up to Jerusalem, that's 500 miles, to worship God. So that's what we know about him, an unlikely candidate for salvation. And out of all the tens of thousands of Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans that need Jesus, the Lord, our God, sovereignly sets his favor on this man and he sends an angel to Philip. Philip is like a deacon in the church and he's an evangelist. We find out, especially in Acts chapter 21, because he's labeled as the evangelist. 
But it says in verse 26 again, Rise up, go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And I want to zero in on this because God's timing is always perfect. That as you walk with God, you're going to see that he sets things up. So Philip goes, not knowing that all that God has in mind, but when he gets to the road, the Spirit starts to tell him, this is your next step. This is what I want you to do. This is what we call supernatural guidance. And it comes one step at a time as we obey, as we walk with Jesus. I've discovered through the years that God actually leads that way one step at a time. His promise is, this is Proverbs 4.12, as you go, this is a literal, literal translation, as you go step by step, I will open up the way before you. As you go step by step, I will open up the way before you. So the first basic principle of divine guidance, of being led by the Spirit, is this. God leads one step at a time. The psalmist said this, the steps of a man are established by the Lord. It's no accident that he used the word steps when he revealed the existence of God's plan in our lives. While God has the whole journey mapped out ahead of time, this is good news for you. God has your whole life mapped out ahead of time. That whole journey, he has it mapped out. He unfolds that journey, though, as successive smaller steps, and that is the way it's made known to us. The foundational principle of guidance is graphically illustrated in another psalm. It says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Back then, when an ancient traveler journeyed at night, he would carry an oil lamp. And as they carried the oil lamp and walked along, they would swing that lamp in front of them so that they would light up the path so they could see the rocks and the ruts directly ahead of them on the road. And that way they avoid them. Sometimes they actually strapped a small clay lamp to their ankle and it lit up the path before them one step at a time as they walked. That's how God uses his word, by the way. That's how God uses his Holy Spirit to guide us. He does not promise this brilliant blaze of light to all of a sudden light up the road for miles ahead. He promises a lamp to our feet. A lamp to our feet, enough light for the next step. Maybe the illustration would be more meaningful and powerful for us here in 2024 if we put it in the terms of just driving a car or a truck at night. The headlights on your vehicle, they do not expose the dangers on the road a mile or so ahead. They just show the next bend in the road. So as you drive at night, think about that. It's the next bend that I see. See, God knows that it may not be best for us to see too far down the highway of our lives. Center point, if he showed us the whole plan at the outset, we might decide we don't want to follow it. If God showed you everything that was going to happen, you would probably go, I don't know. I'm not sure if I want to make those sacrifices because it might involve more sacrifices than we're willing to make at that stage today in our spiritual journey, in our maturity, or it might look too difficult for us to handle at this point where we are spiritually in our growth. Uh, back in the, the 90s, uh, there was a, a singer-songwriter, Rich Mullins, and we'd sing this every summer at Bible camp, but step by step, and uh, he wrote this song, and the words in it simply are, Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. I'll seek you in the morning and I'll learn to walk in your ways. And then he says, and step by step, you'll lead me and I'll follow you all of my days. It's step by step with Jesus for all of our days. That's how we follow him. So in verse 29 here, the spirit says to Philip, go up 
join this chariot. That's all he says. Not what for, not who is in the chariot. He just says, go to the chariot. And Philip in this step-by-step -step process is actually discovering beauty in God's plan because God is unfolding it for him. See, God's plans are not limited by our human understanding or constrained by our desires and expectations. God has a plan that will unfold. They're perfect. They're so deep. There's so much wisdom in his plan, and it surpasses just our human comprehension. Like sometimes God does things and we're like, I didn't see that coming. I don't understand how God worked that out. And that's where God leads us many times. When we align ourselves with God's timing, we open ourselves to a world of blessings, opportunities, and transformative experience. See, God's timing can bring forth blessings beyond what we could ever imagine. But what many of us do is we don't wait well. And we run ahead of God's timing. And we start to mess it all up. We start to do things in our own strength and in our own power when God's like, just wait in my plan. Because if you wait for my plan, blessings, opportunity, transformation will happen. Rather than running ahead and tripping up or running ahead and hitting a wall. And some of us, we just keep hitting that wall over and over because we're stubborn. We don't learn. We don't go back to go, okay, God truly has my life planned out. God truly has this plan for me that's good. As we surrender, as we obey him, we actually allow him to work in our lives. And when we do that, it surpasses our wildest dreams. When you start to, like, think about the biggest dream for your life. And I'm telling you, God's got a bigger dream. Things that we thought when we were younger, like if I had this in my life or if I did this, my life would be fulfilled, it'd be complete. And God's going, no, no, I've got even a better plan. I got better ideas. In his perfect timing, doors open, relationships flourish, circumstances align for the ultimate good of you, and he gets all the glory because he's the one unfolding it. Throughout history and countless individuals' lives today, we see the beauty of God's plans unfold. Stories of divine intervention. Like I love sitting with people and hearing their story and hearing how God divinely intervened. Unexpected providence. I had a friend who uh, would be struggling. This was during our Bible college years, and he was a married student. And they'd be praying just for food. And all of a sudden, there'd be a knock at the door, and they'd open the door, and there'd be bags of groceries. Unexpected providence. Unexpected providence. Miraculous turnarounds serve as a testament to the breath breathtaking beauty that emerges when we actually submit to God's timing. These personal testimonies witness the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. The thing about God is He never fails. He never fails. His promises are true. They bring about his purposes in people's lives. In God's perfect timing, his plans are fulfilled. In God's perfect timing, his promises are realized and his purposes are accomplished. And uh, I've walked through different seasons of life. And I remember, you know, and sometimes the church is horrible for this, but uh, I, I remember being in Winnipeg pastoring and and if you were single, it was almost like pressure that you had to get married. Like, why aren't you married? You're weird. And I was like, ah, oh, man, the church sometimes is so horrible. And, and, and you go for dinner and they're trying to set you up and all this crazy stuff. So sometimes young adults started to freak out. Oh, no, I don't have a significant other. Oh, no, I'm getting older. I remember talking to an individual. She was, she, at the time, she was like close to 30, going to be 39. And she's given up hope. I, it's over for me. And I remember talking to her and I just said to her, statistically, statistically, you still have a really good chance of getting married. No, no, no. No, no. Like, for real. You do. And I'm going to tell you, you most likely will get married. So keep praying and ask God to bring you the right guy because there's a lot of stupid guys. So I left that ministry, it was in 2007, and I got a call in 2000, 
and eight at the end. I'm engaged. Would you come this summer in 2009 to do my wedding? Absolutely. And as I went back to Winnipeg and I met with the couple, you know that smirk where you're just like, I told you this was going to happen. And as I sat with that couple, and even today, like they, they love Jesus. She just celebrated, right, her, her uh, 50th birthday. And I'm just sitting there going, God has a plan. Even when we think it's over. Even when we think there's no hope. His timing is perfect. His purposes is are accomplished. And here in our story, church, the timing of the Spirit proves perfect. At the very moment, Philip, no doubt wondering what he would do, what he would say when he got to the chariot, he hears the Ethiopian eunuch reading out loud the book of Isaiah. And not only that, the place where he's reading is a specific reference to the Messiah, who is Jesus, and everything that he has fulfilled in his death. So it says, as a sheep, in verse 32, as a sheep is led to the slaughter, or a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth, and his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken up from the earth. Now Philip knows what the Lord has been doing in directing him to this desert place, where there is one lone chariot, one man from Ethiopia, and the Lord is having mercy on a man whose nationality, and we talked about it last week, his life circumstance, his identity, might have made him think that the God of Israel would never care about him. Here's this man. And not only that, the Lord is orchestrating the evangelizing of Ethiopia through this man. We can't know for sure, but Irenaeus wrote in the second century that this Ethiopian became a missionary among his people. Philip proclaimed the good news of Jesus to him in verse 35, that the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all in Isaiah 53 verse 6, and that we are set right with God through his death and his resurrection, Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 and verses 11 and 12. And the Ethiopian believed, and then he was baptized along the road, and he went on his way, it says in verse 39, rejoicing, celebrating. While Philip was taken up to Azotus by the Spirit. So what's the point? of this story and that I want us to zoom in on today. Why does Luke include it in the book of Acts? What does he want us to get out of this inspired story? Since as Paul says, and this is out of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man, that the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There's something valuable when we read scripture that he wants us to take out. How does this scripture equip us for every good work? And I think the answer is that the story of Philip and the eunuch here teaches us one of the ways that God uses to evangelize the world. I say one of the ways he uses. Because it's clear from the book of Acts that a lot of evangelism is done. That is, you read through Acts, a lot of evangelism is actually done with it, without an angel of the Lord having to tell Christians to do it in Acts 8 verse 4. It's what well, one does if one loves Jesus. You just start to tell people about Jesus. You just do it if you love Jesus. If you love people, you'll tell, you'll share the good news. You'll preach the good news to other people. Jesus already gave us a command in scripture to be about that, to go into all the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them. We call it the great commission. So you don't have to have an angel of the Lord tell you to do it any more than you need an angel of the Lord to tell you not to do it. Like if there is one thing you should be about is telling people about Jesus. You don't have to Pray, God, give me a sign if you want me to share my faith. God, give me a sign if you want me to share the gospel with my friend who doesn't know Jesus. Oh, no, you don't need a sign. You already got the command to what? Go. 
Go do it. Go share it. Go tell it. But on the other hand, we may be in more danger of making the other mistake, namely of thinking that we can do all that God wants done by simply evangelizing according to our own power, according to our own planning, because some of us, we have the gift of evangelism. Some of us, we already have that passion, and we plot it out, and we plan it out. And, and if we're not careful, we're going to miss something. So what God does is he includes in his inspired word stories and teachings that equip us for another kind of good work. Not just wise and prayerful planning on the basis of our circumstances and what we can see, but also, here it is, listening responsively to the Holy Spirit. Listening and responding to what the Holy Spirit is leading us to. When he may want to tell us to do something that we might never think of doing through our own planning, just like Philip here. Go down to a desert road that leads to Gaza and wait for further instructions. It is only through listening to the Spirit's leading that we start to obey these things. Philip could not have computed from Scripture circumstances. That's where the Spirit was moving next. He wouldn't have been able to put that together and go, this is where, from God's Word, for example, He wants me. No, He had to be listening to the Spirit of God in His life. So the Scriptures are wonderfully sufficient here, like they protect us from error of thinking that the only way God guides us in good work is by reasoning and planning from circumstances and principles though this is good, and they show us that there are works that God may lead us to by means of extraordinary guidance. You will do things in your life listening to the Spirit, following His lead, that if you weren't listening to Him, you wouldn't be about. So we need to position ourselves. Uh, I counted at least 18 instances in this extraordinary guidance in the book of Acts scattered among all the more ordinary ways of making decisions in evangelistic strategy. And since there's no teaching anywhere in the New Testament that says that this work of the Lord is limited to the time of the book of Acts, like some Christians have gone there, that the Holy Spirit, he doesn't work like this anymore. That was just with the apostles. That's just the apostolic age. So that's a good out now to not listen to the Spirit. That's a good out when we go, well, he only worked like that in the book of Acts. But I believe, as you read Scripture, that God still works like this, that he uses his word and he uses the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us among some other things. We should assume that one of God's ways today of building his church is to give direction to his people in extraordinary ways as well as the ordinary ways. I'm always grateful for scripture, how it challenges me, how it applies to my daily life. But then there's other means that God uses to get my attention. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a Bible-based preacher out of Westminster Chapel in London for almost 30 years. And uh, he would preach from 1939 to 1968. And he used this story here of Philip and this eunuch to illustrate just this point. And he cautioned against the misuse of it, but I want to quote Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, here again is a most extraordinary subject and indeed a very fascinating one, and from many angels a most glorious one. There is no question but that God's people can look for and expect leadings, guidance, indications of what they are meant to do. There are many examples of this in scriptures, and I take one at random, and He's going here to our passage in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, of how Philip the evangelist was told by the angel of the Lord, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. He says this, now there are leadings such as that. If you read the history of the saints, God's people throughout the centuries, and especially the history of revivals, you will find this is something which is perfectly clear and definite. Men have been told by the Holy Spirit to do something 
They knew it was the Holy Spirit speaking to them, and it transpired that it obviously was his leading. And he says, it seems clear to me that if we deny such a possibility, we are again guilty of quenching the Spirit. And the reason I quote Martin Lloyd-Jones is because he is a preacher. He is a pastor who believed in the unique authority, the infallibility, the sufficiency of the scriptures. And one of the concerns expressed by people who love the Bible is that being open to supernatural guidance like Philip was might compromise the authority of the scripture, might compromise the sufficiency of the scripture. And obviously, Martin Lloyd-Jones did not think that it did. And I ask the question, why is that? And it's because of this reason. What the sufficiency of Scripture means biblically is that the Scripture gives us all we need for two things. So here they are. It gives us all of the authoritative truth we need in order to be saved and grow spiritually. We got all of the authoritative truth we need for that. And number two, It gives all of the authoritative truth we need in order to make good judgments about what is right and what is wrong. But the sufficiency of the scripture does not mean that God cannot speak through nature. He can. You've probably been there. Where God uses those moments to speak. Psalm 19 verse 1 or that he cannot speak through the human conscience, Romans 2.15, or that he cannot speak through gifts of prophecy and wisdom, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. It means that these are not sufficient to save us. These are not sufficient to nurture us or guide us, but the scriptures are sufficient in the sense that they give the only authoritative rule for completing and assessing those other kinds of revelations. So when you get those type of revelations, what do you do with them? You got to take them back to God's word. You got to go, oh great, ever wake up and just have a dream and just go, what was that about? And I'm telling you, if you don't take it back to God's word, that could just be the pizza you ate and you just had some crazy dreams. So what do you do with this stuff when you're out in nature and you get a sense that, oh man, like the Spirit of God is opening up this area of my life. And normally Baptists are scared to talk about this depending what what group of Baptists they are. But I grew up in one where it's like, Holy Spirit, hide under the chair. If we talk about the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen? And I'd go, if we would have listened more to the Holy Spirit, I believe we would have seen even more things that God wanted to open up that God wanted to do through his church. So uh, even this week, I was praying, and I I had a picture come to my mind, and it applied to what would happen for the rest of the week. A verse came to mind as I pictured it, and I was like, oh, man. And then the reality is it transpired. It happened, and it was through a verse out of Jeremiah. And I was like, oh, man, like God even prepped me and prepared me. I wasn't even seeking that out. It came from a, what we would call a vision, but then it came to his word. And I don't stand up today to preach visions to you. I stand up to preach what? God's word. Because we take every vision, every... So if someone comes to you, I got a word of prophecy for you. Take it lightly, but then take it back to God's word. I'll never forget being 25 years old. I finished preaching and a lady came up to me and after I was done preaching, she said, I I have something that, that I believe the spirit of God wants me to tell you. And she said, in 10 years, you will find out the power in your preaching. I was like, thanks. And I was 25 going, well, I believe God's the power. But I was preaching, I was 35 years old, and I'll never forget it. I finished preaching, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, the power in your preaching is the person behind you, Jesus. It was clear as day. And what came back was that lady and what she said. Now, I didn't stop the service, and I didn't go back up and say, I I got, no, no, wait. That was like, oh, wow. So God was using that lady in that time, and that's why we take it all the time back to God's Word. Where we go off track is when we throw out the Bible, 
And then we start to go, I had this dream, I had this vision, and let me tell you about it. No, no, we, we go to God's word, and God's word brings it to light. Um, let me give you a comparison of a manual on how to use a sailboat. It says on the front of the manual, all you need to know for successful sailing. So the manual claims to be a sufficient guide for sailing. You read the manual, then you get to page six. And on page six, it says, before hoisting the sail, be sure that you know the way the wind is blowing so as to put the rigging in proper position to avoid capsizing or injury. So you take the sailboat out onto the lake and uh, you're, you're, you're in the boat, and before you hoist the sail, you hold a little cloth in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. Now, suppose somebody says, hey, why are you lifting that cloth in the air to find out which way the wind's blowing? The manual says that it contains everything you need to know for successful sailing. Shouldn't you just look in the manual to learn which way the wind is blowing? That's the kind of mistake people make, I believe, when they say that we should not be like Philip today and listen for special direction of the Spirit in, in this case, personal evangelism. So the Bible doesn't rule out that special guidance and the Bible doesn't uh, take its place. The Bible, hear, hear me on this, instead the Bible illustrates it. The Bible advocates it. The Bible regulates it. And it does so for sufficient sufficiently. Uh, we have all the authoritative truth in the Bible that we need in order to properly discern, respond to God's voice, be it in nature, be it in the conscience, or dreams or visions, or extraordinary revelations like this go south to a desert road that leads to Gaza and await further instructions. Or how about this? Go up to this chariot. He has no clue what he's about to say. He has no clue what he's about to do but he goes, he obeys, he follows. Um, I asked a pastor once when I lived out west, when I was in Winnipeg, his church and his people were experiencing some of this, what, what we're talking about, extraordinary guidance. And I asked him, has the, effect been drawn, has the effect been to draw them away from the Bible because of what they're experiencing? Is the excitement of receiving some special direction from the Lord making the Bible uh, seem dull? seem boring, seem unattractive? And his answer was no. And he said this, if anything, their experience is actually driving them to their Bibles more and more, not only for discernment, but also because they have discovered that there's a direct correlation between having the mind steeped and saturated with Scripture and being sensitive to the Spirit of God. There's a connection when you're in God's word and the spirit is speaking and how he connects his word, if people are neglecting, taking time to, to think through scripture, to meditate on the scripture in favor of the impressions and special words, you can be sure that their spiritual reality will not be, uh, they will not be in tune to hear the truth. You need to be in God's word. You need to be sensitive to the spirit. And that's the way actually like most false religions start. Someone had a dream or a vision that wasn't carried back to God's word. Mormon, Mormonism, right? Joseph Smith, a vision not carried back to God's word. That's where some groups start, and then you get some different varieties of it. It's because someone has a false revelation, a false reality. And that's the way these groups start. And it can be so dangerous. But yet at the same time, I would say, uh, despite the danger of it, we need to bring it back here to go, all right, we need to allow God's spirit to lead and guide us, but we, we, we have God's word, so we, we need to take it back. The best way I could illustrate that for you is to talk about knives. Like knives are dangerous. Knives can hurt people, but we don't outlaw them because when they're rightly used, they help prepare food, they help us with eating food, and we don't want to do without them. So we don't want to do without the spirits leading. We want that, but we want to understand it, so we want to take it back to God's word. And I'm sure that most of us 
have a long way to go in simply obeying what we know to do right in our everyday life. Are you there? That I know I should do that. I know I should do, obey that. But it would be a mistake to say that we must arrive at perfection in one area before we take baby steps at another. I believe, in fact, God may be offering breakthroughs in your life and breakthroughs, even in the life of our church, especially in the ministry of evangelism, especially in the ministry of missions, if we were more like Philip. Acts 6.3 says that he, along with six other deacons, were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And because he was full of the Spirit and wisdom, probably from long, I'll just say meditation on Scripture, pondering it, thinking about it, living from it, he was so alert to the voice of the Lord that one day when he was led, I have a divine appointment for you. Go south to the road that leads to, Ga to Gaza. He just went. And God is getting breakthroughs around the world today. Even as I stand here by the most extraordinary means. And in a world of bad news, there is good news. Revival, actually, we pray for it. It's happening. If we would just see, if we would just look, Florida State University this past February, reportedly the, the number two party school in all of the U.S. Here's what took place in February. 4,500 Florida State University students confess struggles and sin in one night. Hundreds came forward to trust Jesus. Hundreds were baptized in a fountain outside in front of the university, usually used for partying and worse. And it's all just the beginning. Literally everywhere right now through the universities among the young adults, revival is here. They're getting baptized in, back, in the back of the trucks. They're filling them with water because they don't have a place to go. And they're getting baptized. They're confessing sin. Auburn University, this is last fall, after a chapel service finished, a girl came up, wanted to get saved. It led to thousands of others going, I want the same thing. Then they said, we want to get baptized. So they drove a little way down to a lake and 6,000 students showed up to worship and praise Jesus and confess sin and get baptized. And baptize, baptisms, it's, they, they report, continued until midnight when the young people sharing their passion with the young people sharing their passion for the Lord. Like that's happening right now. Muslims coming to Jesus, variety of approaches. But the big one that's coming out is dreams. Muslims, particularly, a particular group are open to dreams being, uh, for them, revelation due to the, both the culture and the general acceptance of them and the religious sort of, uh, I'll just say, president put on them. But dreams of Jesus are occurring. In fact, they're they're having dreams where Jesus is speaking scripture to them. Scripture that they've never heard before. Jesus is telling people to do something. A dream or a vision that led to a feeling of being clean or at peace. A man in white physically appearing. This is their testimony. This is what they're saying. And now we follow Jesus. We follow the true Savior, the true Messiah. And yet there's a part of Christianity that goes, no. That stuff doesn't happen today. They're getting saved. They're getting changed. God's at work. His spirit is at work. Now the steadfast day-by-day -day perseverance in the ordinary means of grace is the meat and potatoes. We love our meat and potatoes on PEI. We do. And that is the daily intake of scripture. Eat it up. Love it, read it, live from it. However, God's adding the sprinkling on top, sort of the salt and the pepper. 
And he's giving us these leadings and breakthroughs of the Spirit all over the world. And they're extraordinary demonstrations of his presence. That the only answer, the only glory that could come from that is God. And he's getting the glory. He's getting the honor. I'll close with, with this powerful story. In 1985, Clarence Duncan arrived in Africa as a missionary to the Muslim people in a tribe called the Yao tribe. And when he settled in his village, he called for a meeting with the elders. So he shows up to be a missionary. And after exchanging the pleasantries, uh, the chief asked him his name, and he said, Clarence. He replied, Mr. Clarence. And the council looked at each other for a moment, and then the chief asked, why are you here? Again, Clarence simply said, I want to tell your people about the Isa al Masi." Jesus the Messiah. He wants to tell them about Jesus the Messiah. A couple of months later, when the chief decided he could trust Clarence, he said, do you know why we allowed you to stay? And Clarence said, I, I never thought about it. He said, 21 years ago, a very old Yao man from our village, our, our very uh, old Yao man came to our village and he called for a meeting, just like you did. And when we asked him his name, he said, Mr. Clarence, which isn't an African name at all. And when we asked him why he came, he said, I want to tell your people about Jesus the Messiah. These were your very words. 21 years ago, Mr. Clarence led four of our villagers to follow Jesus. So we ran them out of the village, and we killed Mr. Clarence. The reason we allowed you to stay is we were afraid. That was 1985, three years after, on January, on a January morning, 24, Muslim elders approached Clarence Duncan's house. After a meal, the leader sat in the middle of the room, and he said that they had come to ask questions about Christianity. And Clarence said, fine, but that he would only answer those questions by reading from the Bible so that they would know he did not invent the answers. So he gave each of them a Bible in their language. The first question was, why do you Christians say that there are three gods? And Clarence said the answer was found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And he gave them the page number. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And he mentioned that Jesus said this very thing in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. And then the questioning from them went on till five in the afternoon. When all had left, the leader, uh, Sheikh Abdul Baker, stayed and he asked if he could see Clarence in a week. When they met, Abu asked if Clarence knew what they came to see him last week for. And Clarence said he assumed it was just to ask questions. But Abdu said, no, it was because the Christian church is growing so fast, we had to kill you. We had consulted three days and prepared our magic, and you were to be struck dumb when we asked you questions, and then you would fall on the ground paralyzed, and then you would die. But when you kept talking, and then you even stood up and moved around, we knew you had a stronger spirit, and we gave up. Then Abu said, I want to become a Christian. And then he told an amazing story. He said this, when I was a teenager in our village, we were not Muslim people. We were not Christian. We were a different group with a different religion. Behind our village, there was a hill where I could go and I'd often go to pray. And one day I was on that hill praying and suddenly all around me was a blinding light. Out of this light, I saw a big hand coming towards me, holding an open book. I looked at the book. I saw the writing on the page, and a voice told me to read. I protested that I could not read, never having been to school. And the voice again told me to read. So I did, and suddenly I read the book, and then the hand disappeared. I ran back to my village, and all the people were looking for me, thinking that I had died on that hill. 
and they asked about a fire that they had seen up there. And when I told them the story, they laughed at me. They said, you can't read. So someone got a book and I began to read. Then people came from all around to find out more about what happened and they asked questions. The Muslim authorities found out about me and I was trained in the ways of Islam. Soon all our village became Muslim. For 15 years, I was the greatest debater against the Christians. And he paused and then he said, you remember when I asked you the first question about why Christians believe in three gods and your answer was Deuteronomy 6.4? And Clarence said, yeah, I remember. He then looked at Clarence Duncan in the eye and he said, that was the same passage that this voice on the mountain showed me. At that moment, I knew that the God you were talking about was the true God. Then Clarence asked, why did you keep asking me all those questions for the whole day? And he smiled and he said, I wanted all these Muslim leaders to know that what the Christians believe and I wanted them to hear it from you. The whole day I pretended to be an unbeliever so that I could ask more questions. Now I want to become a Christian. Center point in the midst of a life of steady, persevering faithfulness. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. God has yet more wonders to show us in the work of evangelism and world missions that we could imagine. And as I close in prayer, let's pray for eyes to see, ears to hear when he calls us to these divine appointments. Let's pray and be open to what the Spirit is saying. Heavenly Father, I come before you and I just ask that we would be sensitive to what the Spirit is drawing us to. I pray that in the days ahead as he opens and guides us into conversations, into situations, that we would rely on you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead us, you would guide us, and I pray that we would not quench you. I pray we would not push you down but we would obey, we would follow. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how powerful it is, how solid it is. And I just pray that we would love that as your people. And God, I just look forward to what you're going to do in our lives as we follow the leading of the Spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.